Chapter Twelve of Savarine's Disappearance. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bob Sage. The Gerard Street Mystery and Other Weird Tales by John Charles Dent. Savarine's Disappearance. Chapter Twelve. Still a Mystery. At the head of the stairway she paused for a moment to collect herself before passing down and out into the street. What she had left behind her was of a nature well fitted to excite emotion, and her bosom rose and fell with gentle tenderness and pity. But she had learned self-control in the school of experience, and her delay was a brief one. Mastering her emotions, she walked steadily down the two flights of stairs, opened the front door for herself, and was just about to cross the threshold when a man entered. The light of the street lamp fell full upon his face. It was the face of the man whose mysterious disappearance five years before had created such a profound sensation throughout Western Canada. There was no possibility of mistaking it, though it was greatly changed for the worse. Five years had wrought terrible havoc upon it. The scar on the left cheek was more conspicuous than of yore, and the features seemed to have settled into a perpetual frown. But worst of all, the countenance was bloated and besotted. The nose had become bulbous and spongy, the eyes watery and weak. The man's clothes were patched and seedy, and presented a general aspect of being desperately out at elbows. His unsteady step indicated that he was at least half drunk at that moment. He did not see, or at any rate did not take any notice, of the woman who gazed into his face so intently. And as he staggered on his way upstairs, he stumbled and narrowly escaped falling. Could it be possible that this disreputable object was the man whom she had once loved as her husband? She shuddered as she passed out onto the pavement. Truly, his sin had found him out. She had no difficulty in finding her way back to the hotel without asking questions of anybody. Upon reaching it, she conferred for a moment with the office clerk and then passed up to a small general sitting room where she found her father. The old gentleman was beginning to be anxious at her long absence. Well, father, I find there is an express for suspension bridge at midnight. I think we'd better take it. It is now half past ten. I have learned all I want to know, and there is no use for us to stay here on expense. But perhaps you are tired and would like a night's rest. Found out all you wanted to know? Do you mean to say you have seen him? Yes and I never wish to see or hear of him again in this world. Don't question me now. I will tell you all before we get home, and after that I hope you will never mention his name in my presence. When shall we start? Finding her really anxious to be gone, the old man assented to her proposition, and they started on their way homeward by midnight train. They reached Millbrook in due course, the father having meanwhile been informed of all that his daughter had to tell him. Savarine's disappearance remained as profound a mystery to them as ever, but it had, at any rate, been made clear that he had absconded of his own free will, and that in doing so he must have exercised a good deal of shrewdness and cunning. The question as to how far it was advisable to take the public into their confidence exercised the judgment of both father and daughter. The conclusion arrived at was that as little as possible should be said about the matter. Their errand to New York was already known and could not be wholly ignored. The fact of Savarine's existence would have to be admitted it would inevitably be chronicled by the sentinel, and the record would be transferred to the columns of other newspapers. The subject would be discussed among the local quidnuncs, and the excitement of five years since would, to some extent, be revived. All this must naturally be expected, 
and would have to be endured as best it might. But it was resolved that people should not be encouraged to ask questions, and that they should be made to understand that the topic was not an agreeable one to the persons immediately concerned. It might reasonably be hoped that gossip would sooner or later wear itself out. For the present it would be desirable for Mrs. Savareen to keep within doors and to hold as little communication with her neighbors as possible. This program was strictly adhered to, and everything turned out precisely as had been expected. Mr. Haskins reached Millbrook on his way home to Tennessee within a day or two after the return of father and daughter from New York. He was informed by the father that Randall and Savareen were identical, but that the family wished to suppress all talk about the fair as far as possible. He took the hint and departed on his way homeward without seeking to probe further into matters in which he had no personal concern. It was hardly to be supposed, however, that the local population would show equal forbearance. Curiosity was widespread and was not to be suppressed from a mere sentiment of delicacy. No sooner did it become known that the father and daughter had returned than the former was importuned by numerous friends and acquaintances to disclose the result of his journey. He so far responded to these importunities as to admit that the missing man was living in the States under an assumed name, but he added that neither his daughter nor himself was inclined to talk about the matter. He said, in effect, my daughter's burden is a heavy one to bear, and anyone who has any consideration for either her or me will never mention the matter in the presence of either of us. Anyone who does so will thereby forfeit all right to be regarded as a friend or well-wisher. This did not silence gossiping tongues, but it at least prevented them from propounding their questions directly to himself. He was promptly interviewed by the editor of the Sentinel, who received exactly the same information as other people, and no more. The next number of the paper contained a leading article on the subject, in which the silence of Mrs. Savareen and her father was animadverted upon. The public, it was said, were entitled to be told all that there was to tell. Savareen's disappearance had long since become public property, and the family were not justified in withholding any information which might tend to throw light on that dark subject. This article was freely copied by other papers, and for several weeks the topic was kept conspicuously before the little world of Western Canada. Nowhere was the interest in the subject more keenly manifested than at the Royal Oak, where it furnished the theme of frequent and all but interminable discussion. Not a day passed, but mine host Lapierre publicly congratulated himself upon his acumen in having all along believed and declared that Savareen was still in the land of the living. This landlord shared the prevalent opinion that the family should be more communicative. I have always, he said, been a good friend to Mrs. Savareen. I respect her very much, but I think she might let us know some things more about her discoveries in New York. Scores of other persons harped to the same monotonous tune, but father and daughter submitted to this as to a necessary penalty of their situation and by degrees the excitement quieted down. I am not prepared to say whether the stepmother received further enlightenment than other people, but if she did, she kept her tongue between her teeth like a sensible woman. As for Mrs. Savareen herself, she consistently refrained from speaking on the subject to anyone, and even the most inveterate gossips showed sufficient respect for her feelings to ask her no questions. She held the even tenor of her way, doing her work and maintaining herself as usual, but she lived a secluded life and was seldom seen outside her own house. Thus, several months passed away without the occurrence of any event worthy of being recorded, 
The mystery of Savareen's disappearance remained a mystery still, but the time was approaching when all that had so long been dark was to be made clear, and when the strange problem of five years before was to be solved. End of chapter 12 Reading by Bob Sage